you know, to me, it's uh, about the whole issue of the human place on this planet. And I think we are a species that is uh, absolutely out of control. And we've lost the understanding that humans have had since the beginning of time for humans. We are deeply embedded in and utterly dependent on nature. Farmers understand very clearly that weather, that climate are, you know, determine whether you survive or not. Farmers know that insects are critical for pollinating flowering plants. They know that there are plants that will take nitrogen from the air and fix it as fertilizer. Farmers know the amount of snow in the winter is directly related to the moisture in the soil in the summer. Farmers know we're a part of nature. But we've undergone this enormous shift in the last hundred years where we've lost that understanding as we changed from a rural village animal into a big city dweller. And in a big city, you know, nature is no longer part of, or not much of, of our surroundings. And the most important thing becomes your job. You need a job to earn the money to get the things that you, you want. And so the expression of that is uh, seen when, when Stephen Harper was prime minister. He said, we can't do anything about reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It'll destroy the economy. So he elevated the economy above the very atmosphere that gives us air to breathe, that gives us, uh, that gives us weather, climate, and the seasons. And that's the crisis now. We think that we're so bloody important, and we invented this thing called economics, that e uh, this human invention dominates everything we do. We've got to reconnect with the natural world. We were born with a need to affiliate, to love other species. Now, what happens when you cut down that sense of biophilia, that love of other organisms? I think it's manifested, we know among children, that if we take children out into nature, bullying drops, uh, uh, attention deficit drop, there are all kinds of things the behavior of children is affected by being out in nature. Now you think about people who, uh, who act in a way that we as a society say, that's criminal, and we throw them in jail. I, I am absolutely convinced that a great deal of our problems socially uh, uh, are a consequence of that lack of, of nature. We need nature. We need nature to fulfill us for our health, and uh, we need nature to know where we belong. Nature is our home, not the city. Absolutely. Sorry, I went no, on no, way too please, long, but please. I just wanted to give you a, a sense of why I agreed to do this. People in prisons, I think, are more than just people that have to be dealt with. I think that they, in many ways, are an expression of the loss of biophilia and the consequence of, you know, there are uh, all kinds of factors that lead to them behaving in ways that we consider uh, are criminal. And the, to me, the way that you deal with that is not just lock them up and punish them with the idea that that punishment is going to make them different when they get out. So. You know, I congratulate you on uh, proposing a, a program that allows people to, to affiliate with other species, and there ain't anything, to me, in my experience, more satisfying than actually holding soil in your hand and growing, growing plants. It's just an astounding experience. First of all, to rediscover what children experience when they see a seed turn into a plant. I mean, that's a, it's unbelievable. And it, it is humbling to think that this little seed, depending on the kind of plant it's going to be, has all the information in it to transform itself into this entity. I mean, it's, 
you know, and it's just a little tiny thing. And it's going to take water, it's going to take carbon from the atmosphere, and it's going to take sunlight, and it's going to create itself. What a humble, a humble thing. The miracle of life embodied in a seed is, for me, it's a transforming thing to experience that. And you talked about what was good for children and being in connection with nature and how that is very therapeutic, yeah. very healing, and how it can actually have an impact on, say, bullying behavior. And we know in prisons, there's a lot of violence, there's a lot of antisocial behavior, yeah. and a lot of uh, trauma, childhood trauma. Yeah. They, there's just recently been a report that uh, about at least half of the prison population has experienced physical or sexual abuse as children. Now, how do we heal that? And we see prison farms as an opportunity to be a healing uh, program, a therapeutic program, while modeling the kind of climate change solutions that we desperately need. If prison is more than just punishment, then it seems to me we, we have an obligation that becomes an opportunity to have this group of, of people rediscover our, our real roots, where we belong, and discover relationships. I don't know what the long-term implications are in terms of, uh, you know, recommitting crimes or whatever. Many people are damaged in ways I suppose that are, are beyond uh, uh, um, uh, restitution, but I just think it's, um, it's a real opportunity for these people who, uh, to discover something that will, could potentially change them in a very profound way. Nurturing life. Absolutely, and what a miracle life is. You know, to me that's the, the thing. I, I love walking my, uh, one of my grandchildren to, to daycare because as we walk, I rediscover the world through his eyes, the miracle that he discovers, I said, oh wow, you know, I take it for granted. Rediscovering the miracle, because as an environmentalist, I know that the earth, the planet has been very badly damaged by our unthinking activity. But through the child's eyes, it's still a miracle. It's a wondrous place. And uh, that gives me so much more energy to try to, uh, to heal the things that we've destroyed. Now I know that there, there are proposals to, to have animals like uh, 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 goats or I don't know, cows or sheep or They're whatever. They're doing 1,500 goats yeah. in an intensive operation. Well, I think that it is important for us to come into contact with animals as well as plants. But uh, the, the reality is that the crisis we face today in terms of climate change says that an animal, that a meat-based uh, uh, agriculture is very, very uh, expensive in terms of climate change. So I think that in, in, in dealing with a, a kind of sustainable agriculture, uh, it has to be much more emphasis on, on plants. I, thank you. Yes, I agree. And we've actually proposed a model of a sanctuary care for animals, so a very small scale, um, no-kill uh, model for animal therapy, which would actually follow an animal-assisted mm -hmm. therapy model rather than an animal agriculture operation, which is not a model of yeah. animal therapy. Yeah. And we know that prisoners are capable of tenderness and compassion towards Absolutely. animals, and that's a core benefit of the farm program, so we feel that it's rather important. Uh, we, we've even heard from a prisoner at the prison Joyceville Institution in Kingston where this is all going to be set up and how for over a course of a, a year or two there was a chipmunk that would visit every day and the prisoners grew to love that chipmunk. They built a little chipmunk house yeah. for it and they would visit yeah. and feed it every day and one day by quite by accident, an accident happened and the chip, chipmunk died and the prisoners grieved. So they're capable of that bonding, that tenderness, Absolutely. that protective instinct. And there's actually a slaughterhouse at Joyceville Institution, and prisoners are trained in slaughtering and butchering animals. And now we're going to have this fully indoor, intensive uh, goat dairy operation. And it is just, it seems like it's going in completely the mm -hmm. wrong direction, and that it could actually uh, cause further harm and emotional desensitization, where we should actually be de accomplishing the opposite, nurturing yeah. that innate ability to have empathy and tenderness. I think having prisons with uh, 
save, taking care of, of birds and, and mammals that have been injured by human act. It's a great idea. I never thought of that. That's a great idea. There's actually a sanctuary in Florida, a prison sanctuary, where oh, wow. it started off, So, and they've been operating for over a decade, fully self-sustaining, very successful, very healing That's for the great. inmates. And it started off with, there used to be, it's in the Keys, and there were ducks that would cross the road, and occasionally the ducks would get injured, and yeah. so the sheriff at, yeah. the, at the jail said, well, let's take it in and take care of it. And now they have, I think, over 100 animals, rescues, everything from a sloth to an emu to a goat, yeah. which is the most popular because it's, they say it's like a dog. The goat is like a dog, French fry the goat. <laughs> and um, so we, we know this is possible. We know the benefits of it. And it would cost a fraction yeah. of setting up this very complex um, dairy operation that they're doing here, yeah. which also brings into question the ethics of prison labor. But we, we really feel that our government has a responsibility to model climate change solutions, and that we, as public citizens, have a responsibility to push our government to recognize the seriousness of the, of the crisis and to take proactive approaches and modeling, say, farming for the future and assist farmers in making that transition. Yeah, absolutely. It's a no-brainer. Thank you, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Dan Perraro, um, the cartoonist, Bizarro Comics, yeah. he said that same thing. Really? Yeah, it's a no-brainer. Yeah. yeah. Um, but how? I know that you've talked about in some of your writing about some of your experiences um, as an environmentalist, having, say, been experienced some bullying from the scientific community or government marginalizing environmentalists. And I feel like we've been experiencing a little bit of the same mm -hmm. in terms of uh, bullying from industry, trying to push this thing forward mm -hmm. for economic, short-term economic gains. But we are demonstrating to them that they can make money and in fact, we believe we can make more money at a smaller investment mm -hmm. with this model while drawing global attention to the kind of solutions that we need, mm -hmm. agricultural solutions. I hate that. I hate the idea that you have to go in and justify something on the basis of the, of the economy because that's what's really destroying uh, the, the environmental movement. We've got to go in. You know, I. Well, it's everything, whether you're fighting a pipeline, you're trying to stop uh, uh, fishing in an area, you're trying to stop uh, cutting this forest down. We always end up having to, to give a, a reason why that, you know, you're not, you're not losing jobs or... Well, there are higher reasons. You know, we, I fought for the Stein Valley in... Uh, in British Columbia because for indigenous people, the valley is sacred. And here we were, you know, we're trying, the forest company was saying, well, we got this many jobs, this much profit, this many cubic meters of pulp, this many board feet of lumber, what have you got to offer? And I'm having to say, well, you could pick berries and salal bushes for a tree arrangement and uh, or flower arrangement and uh, maybe we'll find a cure for cancer like, this is ridiculous. It's sacred to the indigenous people, right? And the econom economic argument always overwhelms a higher rationale for what you want to do. And it is a short-sighted argument because it's about short-term profits versus a long-term investment into our very future. Yeah. You know, and the indigenous factor does play into the prisons. They represent 25% um, of the federal prison population exactly. despite being 4% of Canada's exactly. population. So that is a human justice issue They're right there. Yeah. And we know that indigenous, traditional indi indigenous culture has a profound respect for nature yeah. and our interconnectedness with nature. There was a documentary that I watched, one of my favorites, um, National Film Board of Canada called Karolunat, Why White People Are Funny. Oh, if you haven't seen it, you have to see it. It's one of my favorite documentaries of all time. It was made by Inuit, uh, who have been studied for generations yeah. now, and who decided to turn the lens and to study white people back <laughs> <laughs> It's absolutely marvelous. And there's one scene in that documentary where a young Inuit woman um, talks about her first time coming into white society, coming down to Toronto, and driving through the city and seeing the monolithic buildings. And at one point, she saw this massive boulder in the middle of a town square. And her response to that was, that's a misuse of nature. I don't know what the purpose of a boulder is, but it's not that. And if you take that same lens and apply it to something like this, an intensive 
animal agriculture operation within a prison where 25% of the population is indigenous. And if that boulder in that town square is a misuse of nature, then what is this? And how disrespectful that is to, to the people who will be participating and how I know that you have criticized governments for failing to act on climate change and calling it crimes against future generations. Mm -hmm. And that's how I feel about what's happening here. And after our three-year effort to have so much as a conversation, um, that it's, it's frustrating. Yeah, but well, <laughs> that's, your, uh, that's your fight. It is, and it's all of our shared fight. I know your daughter has talked about uh, she, she talked about how your, your, her mother would describe environmentalism as global housekeeping mm -hmm. and that it's about taking responsibility and doing something. And this was the justice issue that landed on my doorstep and I'm just trying to do something. Yeah, well. And if everybody took their little corner of the world and tried to do something, then I do believe that there's still an opportunity to restore uh, a hopeful future. Well, I hope you're right. I know we that don't have much time. We don't. But uh, anyway. My hope is that the young generations coming out today, we have young people addressing the United Nations and making statements saying to the world leaders, we don't expect you to listen to us. You haven't listened to us before. We don't expect you to listen now. But we're here to tell you that change is coming, whether yeah. you like it or not. Uh, Greta Thunberg has, has had a huge impact because she's just saying it like, you know, like, our, you're, you're destroying our future. And you use all these words, but you're still destroying our future. Like, and the innocence of, of children is, un, you know, you can't deny, you can't say, oh, you've got an ulterior motive or, or something. They're speaking the truth. And it's a very tough time. We're in a huge extinction crisis. The tragedy to me is that we are now endangering the future for our own children, our own species. Anyway. But we have to try, you know, that's, that's uh, all we can do is do our best. Yes, I, I, likewise I wrestle with hope and hopelessness, but it always for me comes down to the conclusion that hope doesn't matter. Hope doesn't matter. Hope doesn't matter. Because what's right and good and just and true does not depend on whatever future or outcome I either mm. desire or fear. And out of that feeling of helplessness, I think, is out of helplessness comes both hope and hopelessness. Hope as an antidote, helplessness as despair. Yeah. And yet we have to act regardless and do what we need to do regardless. So we just have yeah. to keep moving forward. There are people that say that hope, in fact, is, is counterproductive because when people have hope, they go, oh, well, you know, it, it'll work out. Uh, I don't agree with that. I think that without hope, it paralyzes you. And my hope is that we can't say it's too late. Even though, I, as a scientist, I see where all the curves are going. We don't know enough to say it's too late. The most prized species of salmon in the world are the sockeye salmon. And the biggest run of sockeye in the world is in the Fraser River. And we like to have 30, 35 million sockeye returning. That's a big number. And in 2009, uh, just over one million came back. And I remember turning to my wife and saying, that's it, there isn't enough biomass to get them up to the spawning grounds. A year later, we got the biggest run of sockeye in 100 years. Now, that doesn't show how stupid I am. Nobody knows what the hell happened. Nature shocked us. And so I like to think that if we can give nature a chance, she will surprise us. And uh, that's, that's my hope. So, you know, the, the population that you're dealing with is a very special subset of the world, but a really important one. And I think uh, the proposal, the idea of getting the people back to into the soil, give them the opportunity, is a, a very, very important one. I went to a very profound uh, uh, traditional 
gathering at Turtle Lodge uh, outside of Winnipeg last year. And uh, Dave Corshane, the elder who was leading this whole thing, uh, the first thing he did is he got us up and handed each of us a handful of soil and said, that's, that's life. That's where we get our, our life from. And now, coming to this lodge, I am, I am going to get you to promise to begin to take care, starting from that handful of soil. That's your job, is to take care of life. And to get men and women, incarcerated men and women, to actually be able to take that soil, to realize in one handful of soil are billions and billions of organisms and probably millions of species of micro that we have never identified. That's a really important thing. And we are able to, to make a living, to live off that soil. So I wish you very well in this proposal. I think it's a wonderful uh, notion. And it's got, we all have to do this, all of us. Yeah, and prisoners love the idea of modeling innovative solutions and being a part of transforming society and contributing. These are not people who want to just sit around being antisocial and I hate society and I don't want anything to do with it. They want to be a part of solutions. They yeah. want to contribute. They want meaningful work, work opportunities. And if we did something like organic permaculture that's intensive, it's labor intensive, it gives them work to do, hands right there in the soil while producing healthy food for prisoners. And Canada's food guide has been completely revised now and prisons follow the food guide. And so we feel that this is an opportunity for the prison farms to model exactly the kind of solutions that the food guide has identified, give prisoners meaningful opportunities, and just, they, they are excited. And they yeah. hate the idea of goat. I'm not the guy you should be telling this to. You've got to sell it to I know, people. I so know. So that's... Uh, Why there is a massive failure on the part of the public to recognize just how serious the situation is. So we've got our work cut out for both of us. You've got your work cut out for you. Uh, you know, I was just reading an article here that says if we plant, I don't know how many billion trees around the world, that we could remove the last 10 years of carbon dioxide emissions. So, and it just occurs to me, this would be a project I know a lot of the indigenous people in in prisons would love is we've got to reforest the planet. Everywhere there were forests, we've got to plant trees and grow them again. And that means, you know, where we live now, which is cities, we've got to reforest the city. We need an urban canopy. And uh, I, I don't see why prisoners couldn't be part of that as well. Um, prisoners, everybody. I'm now thinking of a proposal where we, I don't know how many billion trees we can plant in Canada, but I want to recruit kids in schools and I want to make it a part of what they do is they're going to start growing trees. And uh, we've all got to do that. Prisons are simply a manifestation or an expression of something that's profoundly, profoundly wrong in society in general. And for me, I think that we've lost our place as a species, our sense of the earth as our mother and our responsibility to protect her so she can continue to be as, as uh, productive and generous as she was in the past. It's time for society to evolve, but it's very important and it's time long overdue for prisons to evolve as well because they've got to be a part of the solution. Thank you.